the Mughals were at the height of their power under Aurangzeb, who ruled from 1658 to 1707 in India. Just as wealthy Europeans craved Chinese silk and porcelain, they did the same for Indian tea, sugar, cane, cotton, indigo, and other spices. Due to exports, taxes would increase. The population increased less than China's, only from 150 million to 200 million between 1600 and 1800 due to disease and famine. Problems would begin when Aurangzeb reversed Akbar's tolerance toward other religions. He started to tax non-Muslims at a higher rate. The Muslim Mughals were a minority, while most were Hindus. Provincial leaders that collected these taxes hired their own armies, and internal civil uprising occurred, especially in the Hindu areas called the Maratha kingdoms. They initiated guerrilla warfare against the Mughals. This drained Aurangzeb's treasury, and other provincial leaders saw the leader's weakness and held back tax payments. Aurangzeb would die in 1707, and India would be attacked from Afghanistan, furthering the decline of the Mughals. So in short, India was at the height of its power. However, Aurangzeb reverses the tolerance of Akbar the Great and starts to tax minorities. This causes instability. When you have internal instability, it also leads to other foreign rulers being more adventurous. So inside you had the Maratha Hindu kingdom and to the outside you also had the Shahs of Persia and different overlords of Afghanistan that weakened India's central rule. Due to this weakness that led an opening for the British. The European commercial powers had established factories or merchant warehouses in many Asian ports. They housed raw products to be exported to their home countries. The British could never have enough force to subdue all of India. Therefore, their strategy was to divide and conquer. The East India Company had a factory in Calcutta, Bengal. Their people were majority Muslims, and the Muslim Nawab, or ruler of Bengal, seized the British fort. However, Robert Clive, a soldier of fortune, outmaneuvered the new Nawab. He formed an alliance with Hindu bankers and administrators that would rather work for the British. Also, the British bribed the Nawab's uncle to side with his forces with the British. In the 1757 Battle of Plassey, the Nawab's force of 50,000 was defeated by Clive's 800 British troops and 200 Hindu sepoys or recruits. Again, the key to this, if you look at the numbers, how can 50,000 win against 2,800? The British were very strategic. When the Nawab's forces had lined up, they had bribed his uncle, who actually had many of those 50,000 men desert. This caused confusion, and the 2,800 English and Indian sepoys would be victorious. This destroyed the Mughals, and Clive used diplomacy to keep all of the factions fighting against each other. Notice the Maratha states. To the east, you have the Battle of Plassey. So the British had gained the area in the light pink, and eventually they would move to the north. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. The British use the policy of divide and conquer, and they take India piece by piece, putting the Marathas against the Mughals, and the Mughals against other tribes, and eventually they would spread their influence over the whole area. There would be a situation that caused conflict while Clive was in power in India. The Bengal famine of 1770 to 1772 killed millions of Indians, while the East India Company's warehouses were full. Parliament would pass the India Act in 1784, which made India a formal colony of the British. Lord Charles Cornwallis, the British general that surrendered to George Washington during the 1781 Battle of Yorktown during the American Revolution, became the Governor General of India. The British would defeat the Maratha kingdoms 
1818 and expand their rule over the subcontinent.